OK, uh, my name is Alex. I'm in software development around 18 years, um, mostly C++ development, but also I have some experience with Go, just three maybe or maybe a bit more. So, and uh, today I'm going to talk about mutexes, deadlocks, and one potential way to deal with this problem, which could be quite useful in some cases. So, first of all, uh, let's talk about why, actually. First of all, so Go gives us cheap concurrency. That's nice, but in the same time, this feature, or I often ever use it a lot. And also, second thing is uh, application could have state. Not all application, but some of them. Let's say, let's let's say you have a manager, and manager cloud manager object manage some state for your application, and that's nice and good until you have cheap concurrency. Because with cheap concurrency, you have situation when multiple uh, objects, multiple threads, are trying to get access to your single object. And uh, it leads us to something like this. You have structure with, let's say, two fields. And you have mutexes, which protects your fields, because because you don't, you, you know about concurrent access, you, you know about deadlocks, and that's uh, acceptable. We're doing it from time to time, but can we do better? Basically, is it possible to have a structure like this instead of our or, uh, instead of my original typing? So, how to do, how to achieve such situation, and uh, how can we use it? So few words about motivation, why we may want to have it. When we have mute access, when we are trying to protect our code from uh, concurrent execution, we should think a lot about uh, how big code, um, code block is. You should choose not too big from one side and not too small from other side. And uh, Definitely easy solution is let's lock whole function. It will work, but you don't have concurrence anymore. So maybe you should uh, lock on if blocks, but that also have some issues. And uh, that's not every, uh, that's not all because let's say you also need to choose when you should use a read lock, when you should uh, use read write lock. So a lot of things. And you should not forget to unlock your locks because uh, defer will help you a lot, but defer works just on function scope. It will not work on, let's say, your for scope, if scope. So in some cases, you cannot uh, um, unlock your mute access automatically. You should use, you should do it by hand. In other languages, you will not have this problem, basically, but that's what we have in Go. And uh, why we care about as less as possible uh, function locks? Basically because of these Adam law. That's quite uh, theoretical part and actually we should care just about at least uh, now one or one minus P, where P is uh, your code which could be executed in parallel. Because here, let, let just uh, let's say you have um, twenty-five percent of your code could be executed in parallel. It means if you will execute this code in ten executors, you will have speed up just just a bit higher than three times. If you will execute on one hundred executors, you will have speed up even less than four times. But it's still just theoretical. Uh, limits because on in in real life you will have contact switches you will have some events which are happening in your system and the real speed up will be even slow so that's uh, actually my reason why we're trying to lock as less as possible 
but at the same time we should not have a deadlock so that's quite complicated and um, how basically application interact in concurrent world there are two main approach yes i know we have uh, some others let's say we have uh, uh, so let, let, let's talk about this uh, first so uh main and most commonly used is shared memory i think everyone know about this way you have actually my initial uh, my initial code was about this approach second approach is message passing we have two main uh, message passing ways or algorithms is uh, communication uh, communicating sequential processes this is go away or actors model in some languages they have actors model by default so let's uh, have a brief talk about this model what they are how they use it as i mentioned short model actually is available for almost every language you can find few languages which doesn't allow you to have a short memory but still it's just a few and uh, it's fastest way because as soon as you have one object in memory you shouldn't copy anything you uh, all your thread or even all your processes can have access to single memory so it's fastest you cannot I mean, you cannot introduce anything faster than shared objects but everything have a price and in case of shared object price is deadlocks races and quite complicated code so sometimes it's good but csp is your you, main way in, way main way for communication in csp model is a channel at least in uh, not in hor uh, mod uh, description or papers but in real world how how it was adopted so now in go we have channel the csp is definitely much more secure and compare with short uh, memory but it's still you can have a deadlock because one go routine may have multiple channel so you still have a way to have a deadlock even channel is a mutex by itself by its nature so you can have issue with this approach actors i think it bit less well-known um, way for organizing uh, concurrent uh, communication but it's still very useful uh, the difference between uh, csp and channels are channel have identity so uh, sorry uh, actors have identity each actor can uh, each actor have your its, its unique id and uh, in uh, CSP, you just send in a message into channel and you read message into channel. In actor world, you send message to actor. And uh, that's a uh, very important difference because you, uh, your framework can uh, organize uh, message sent for you. So you will um, have less possibility for deadlocks you will have less possibility for races but let's talk not about uh, actors as it is because we don't have any cheap implementation actor for go when i'm talking about cheap i mean let's say in erlang we have uh, actors out of the box for go we have csp out of the box and we should try to deal with it somehow so what i'm talking about this is quite ancient uh, pattern which was described in POSA book which is also really ancient 1996 but it still could be convenient in some cases so what we have uh, here we have one processor which works on own thread we have multiple consumers which want something from processor and the only way to 
consumer and processor for talk to each other is a queue, message queue. We have message queue requests. Uh, this message queue, actually, when consumer wants something from processor, it will send a message. This message will be added into request message queue. Processor is synchronous. So it will it, it works in all thread, but it executes requests one by one. So as soon as first request processes it, it gets next from queue, do something with it, and send a response to consumer. And now I'm going to talk how to organize this uh, such uh, model and uh, how it could help us. So First of all, now it will be more practical, not theoretical, but so first of all, how to talk, how to tell our, um, pro um, our processor what we want. Let's imagine our processor will do just two things. It will generate a random number. The random number generation is an example of fast command, command which could be executed very fast. And uh, let's say we will have one slow command, run CMD means run something, run some command in, from your operation system. Let's say you, we, we, we can ask a processor to run LS or a call, so something from your environment. And this example second run CMD is a slow command. So, and the idea is slow command shouldn't affect fast command anyhow. They should be absolutely independent. So, let's see our request structure. Request is actually this part. What we send to our processor. Oops. So, request will have three fields. Command ID because we should tell our processor what we're expecting from him. Interface with data. Unfortunately, we should use interface because of no metaprogramming. And output channel. So this channel is basically a way to send message back to our consumers. And that's what we will send back. We will send something because we have general solution, so we can send absolutely anything. And uh, again, the interface is the only way to do it. I don't like it, but that's the only way. Event loop. Our processor should have event loop. It means it should read message and decide what to do with this message. Also, we should have a way to terminate our event loop. That's why we have two channels. Cha one channel with just a flag, nothing more, and one channel with requests, where requests is the structure. So that's our request. What we actually ask in our event loop to process for us and give result for us. So we we'll read our request and call some function for further processing. How we will process requests? As I mentioned before, we have two types of requests. One fast and one slow. Fast request we can process just in place. Let's say like here. That's definitely for just illustration purposes. But the idea is if your request is fast, let's just process it on place. It could be something different. Let's say you are caching your data. In this case, you can search for, for data in your cache right in place and send it back. Or if you have slow request, like do something uh, which will take long time, you should never block your execution thread. So it means you should move this um, task out of your main loop. Go routine is a very good way to do it, so we will execute it in uh, extra thread. And this is our long request. Let's say 
So first of all, this sleep is just for illustration purposes, nothing more, because actually um, command line uh, command also could execute it quite fast, and uh, for illustration, I, I, I was thinking about real delay. So uh, the sleep is nothing more than, um, than illustration. And uh, here we have request. As you remember, we use interface, so we need to convert our uh, convert our request to some data. We execute in our request and send in response to output channel. Uh, let me return back. So this is our command data. This is our response channel, and uh, this request was. We choose this case based on that request. That's how we, uh, we what we are, how we are dealing with long commands. And just a few final actually things like how we should initialize this. First of all, we need dump channel. It could be blocked channel. We don't care how many elements we store in our channel. It should be input channel. Input channel should have some buffer. How big this buffer, it's up to you, but sorry. But size should reasonably big. I mean, we shouldn't block our executors or our callies, uh, callers just because we don't have um, uh, room in our channel. So 10, 20, it depends on your workflow. And last step, let's just execute our event loop. And that's basically this. So this processor works in own, event, in own uh, go routine, in own thread. And so that's why we executing it in own thread. And uh, as I mentioned before, input channel is the only way to tell our, our processor to do something. So we want to call, let's say, a last comment. Okay, we should send such request. Uh, we mentioned here that that's run CMD. This is our comment and response. So even we have a uh, one second delay, if something else, some other request, let's say gen number, will be called before this response is ready, it will be processed first because that uh, because um, we are moving long comment into own uh, own routines. You may think, how can I reuse asynchronously calculated uh, res data results? Let's say you want to cache or uh, cache your executed command results. So you should pass, in this case, you should pass them into a uh, processor somehow. And that's the, actually the only way and uh, that uh, works very well. So you just can send it as a message back. You need to, um, in this case, you need just introduce new com command, run CMD result. And this comment will be processed as any other comment in your main execution cycle inside the um, processor. Yep. I think quite fast, but anyway, that's all for now. So if you have questions, welcome. Why did you decide to pass the request object as opposed to passing a pointer to the request object. Uh, Any thoughts about that? You mean here? Yeah, you, you generate a new request for your reply mm -hmm. response. Uh, why don't you just, uh, you pass a reference to the original request. Ah, you mean, you mean this, uh, that's uh, just for illustration. Yes. No, no, no reason for this at all. Okay. That was, uh, you know, my idea was to create uh, as simple as possible. And that's okay. why, let's say, I didn't include these into. Uh, yeah, so yeah. no reason for this. All right, got it. Yeah. I, 
I like this method because it's something which I, I actually put into practice. That's very useful because in our code base we had a lot, at, okay, not lot of, but multiple um, manager objects which uh, had lots of mutexes because we were trying to lock as small piece of our code as possible and you know it really was a nightmare in terms of support. When we switched into this way I wouldn't say it's lower because uh, basically here you're also locking just minimum part of your code base and uh, mutex uh, sorry and channel is kind of your mutex and communication ways in same time. So in terms of speed it works more or less same and uh, maybe even faster because uh, you, because just because you not always can choose right uh, scope for locking. So this may work faster, may work slower. It depends on how good you are in playing with mutexes. But it's definitely safer because you have zero mutexes. You have zero way to have a deadlock here because main code which is in processor are uh, single-threaded. That's all.